My name is Sarah Cochran and I am chief curator and I would like to thank the three of the artists in the show who are up here today. Um, Alice Hope, Candice Hill Montgomery and Laurie Lembrick. Um, I would like to thank many of the artists who are also in the show, such as Bastien and Louise, and I would especially like to thank uh, Kerry, who is in the back, who helped install it, so nothing happens without uh, Kerry. And I'd like to thank everybody else in the artistic community who is here, as well as everybody. So welcome, and thank you for being here. Um, we will be having another round table, as well as an Insight Sunday, and also Helena Henmark will be speaking. Um, all of these events, as well as many, many more, are on our website, so uh, please uh, don't be strangers. Um, it matters what we do here, but it matters more that you show up and uh, engage with us. So thank you for today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Um, I'm going to do some brief introductions of our panelists today, um, and I'm going to do it in alphabetical order. Um, and Obviously, none of them need uh, introductions in our community, but nevertheless, it is always nice to recognize the hard work of artists in the show. So Candice Hill Montgomery is the first, alphabetically, um, as long as I'm doing that correctly. Obviously, a multidisciplinary uh, artist and writer, um, uh, someone who has worked in collage, in painting, um, a lot of poetry, and who took up weaving in 2004, which is something I'm really, sorry, 2014, and that is something I'm interested in talking about. We are very, very grateful to Candace for the large and very beautiful work she has upstairs. Um, it is, I believe, one of the largest weavings you have ever done? Yeah? Um, Candice has obviously been a recipient of the Guggenheim NEA. She has had shows in the New Museum um, Guild Hall. Uh, she is a tremendous member of our community, and Candice, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Alice Hope is uh, next alphabetically, and uh, um, Alice has uh, her MFA from Yale. Um, she is a wonderful sculptor, um, somebody who has been using these really wonderful tabs, and it's nice to see a number of you wearing the little golden tabs. Um, it always feels like the Légion d'honneur. Those who know uh, Alice have their little necklace. Um, those you found about a decade ago, um, and uh, the sculptures, you have done major public commissions um, around the country, uh, long, as well as around the state, as well as it made many major museum shows. Um, so thank you for that. And Laurie, of course, photographer, fiber artist working in um, both knitting and weaving. Laurie has also allowed us to uh, show a work, a series of work that you have been working on since 2016, but it is the first time they have been shown publicly. And we are very grateful to her for that trust in being able to show them. Um, so with that, I'm going to sit down um, and um, I'm going to start by saying that one of the questions, and I, I think it gets to kind of one of the questions in the room, is the idea of fiber itself in a kind of antiquated idea of hierarchy of the arts. Um, I have been asked how I decide who is an artist and who is a craftsperson. And what I like to say is that um, for myself and obviously Eric Fischel, uh, the co-curator on the show, those were not questions we asked ourselves. We allow artists to take one, the other, both, or any other kind of um, definition or, or identity. So perhaps it would be interesting to kind of jump off with this question of how you see yourself as an artist working in these unusual materials and um, if that has changed over time. Uh, it, we can go. We can go reverse. <laughs> well, I'll say something. Okay. Um, I 
already juggled this uh, idea when I started to work in photography because for a long time photography was considered only as a craft. So um, I think that now I don't really entertain a worry about whether it's craft or art. I think it's the intention and um, the feeling that you have when you're working and the journey that you're on that could be a little bit different. But I think um, we rarely, off, very often hear arts and crafts as kind of one word almost. So um, that's my comment. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Well, my grandmother taught me um, the craft of knitting and needlepoint and all of the thread arts uh, aside from uh, weaving. So that's why I took weaving up because that was the one thing that I didn't really know how to do um, And uh, as an adult. Um, after I retired from teaching, I got a book and uh, I saw Sheila Hicks's work and I really wanted to uh, translate my own thoughts about um, about uh, threads into a, a medium that I didn't really know how to do. Um, I, to answer your question, I really did think that uh, the thread arts were more of a craft when I was growing up. I, since I did know how to do all of those things, and they were done, you know, like for, you know, I used to beg my grandmother to like make me this, and I had a specific idea of what I wanted her to knit for me. Um, uh, they weren't things that were in stores. They were like, I wanted a red, like, mohair sweater with pearl buttons <laughs> with the arms up to here, or I wanted um, a cable knit, um, like, sweater vest in bright orange that was before, a, what do you call those things that are short? Uh, crop, crop top sweaters in a way. Um, so, you know, she would always say, well, you should do it yourself. And I was like, well, no, I, basically, <laughs> I want it the way I want it. She was like um, an incredible uh, knitter and th all things woven and sewn, uh, which she passed down to my, my aunts and my mom. Um, but I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't very good at sewing, but you know, the embroidery part of it. So I never really had an idea um, when I went to art school as a child, um, you know, it was uh, painting with grown-ups and they, I, you know, you weren't saying, oh yeah, I do knitting, you, you know, <laughs> that wasn't part of the, that wasn't part of the equation in the arts. So uh, when I uh, came out here, I wasn't really thinking about the weaving or any of th this other stuff. The, you know, when the parish came to my studio, they happened to see some weaves laying around. They, and you know, they were looking at paintings and I, they, you know, I was like, they were like, what's this? And I, and I was like, oh, that's, just some weaving, <laughs> and and that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. You know, I, I had to change my own perception about what I was doing. Yeah. It's on. Okay. Well, you used the word drape and. Um, which is interesting in the context of weaving. I once had, uh, I once went around the Metropolitan Museum to look at drape, and and it's a it's a fundamental concept in art history. So um, especially with the in the Greek and Roman um, wing, how how drape is represented. So. Um, from that context, I think it's like really highbrow <laughs> how it, how it um, shifted art history. 
But I'm, I'm not afraid of craft either, um, but I stumbled upon it. I didn't know I was doing it until somebody referred to my work as craft. And I think of um, craft as really just being highly intentional um, and re repetitious, but I was drawn to repetition from more like a minimalist um, economy of means using the same simple act and repeating it. Um, but then it was, it started being called craft. And the other thing is how I stumbled upon it was I didn't pursue textile, I pursued um, fish, fish netting, like commercial fish netting, which is made from, sometimes it's made from cotton. So that, that um, transformed ported me over um, to weaving as well. So I think that in each of the pieces that you have upstairs, um, you've been very intentional about the naming of your pieces. Um, Candace, you obviously are referring to the poem by um, uh, I, I, I won't say Timothy Leary, but that's wrong. It's Edward <laughs> Leary. Edward Leary. <laughs> um, sorry. And um, obviously, Laurie, you are talking about the artists with whom you have engaged and hope you are dealing with a word that is very closely linked to the kind of flight patterns of starlings. Um, I'm really interested if how important kind of titles are to your work. Um, and sort of when they come in your processes. Well, I'll start because um, titles are very important to me, but this, this, I didn't start off with a poem by Edward Lear. Uh, that came at the end of the piece. I didn't know what I was doing with that piece. Uh, it, it just kind of made itself in a way. And I wasn't really feeling my best when I was doing the piece. Saskia actually had to help me move the branch. It's very heavy. It looks light as it sits up there, but it's extremely heavy. And so I was so concerned with that part of it. It was in a bedroom, and it was taking up the whole entire room. It, it you know, it was foul smelling, and um, so the title unlike some of my other pieces, came at the end when I was recuperating mm -hmm. from surgery. And I um, uh, was reminded about the Edward Lear poem about the Jumblies and, uh, and moving and sitting in a sieve. And it just was like that, it was just totally that piece. Um, I think titles are, should be, it's, you know, they don't have to be specific to what the piece is about. I mean, you can abstract uh, a particular title ad infinitum, but this to me was, it's, it doesn't look like a sieve, but the whole process for me was sitting in a sieve. <laughs> and um, that's where that title came from. <laughs> I um, tend to be very uh, reticent and lazy about titling, and most of my work is untitled. Um, but in the case of this piece, um, the title is important because it's it's the second. Um, it's in reference to um, my study of the sardine run in South Africa. And um, it's just this immense, um, miles long, I, it's seven kilometers. I haven't um, changed that to miles, but and very, very wide and deep um, with the comparable biomass of the wildebeest um, migration. It's literally billions of sardines, but sardines, uh, optically are um, one of my first 
inspirations at an aquarium, just how, how they um, collectively switch direction. I, I know that I'm not close to representing that sort of optical magic, um, but just even if I wink at it, I'm um, mm, not quite satisfied, but. <laughs> Uh, very often when I start to uh, negotiate attempting something new in my studio, it seems that I pull out a book about Cezanne. And um, I think the first weaving that I did in this series um, was actually a painting by Cezanne, which I think I printed and wove three different ways, trying different materials. And um, I think um, a carry through thread in my work or why I'm motivated to do things is a constant sense and awareness of amazement. So um, I was kind of curious about how Cezanne put color together in the painting and how our eye reads it uh, as opposed to the paintings that came before him. And um, starting to cut paintings up and just thinking about them in terms of their color and what they contained and um, the balance of color even if it were rearranged. So um, I think in the end because each one of those pieces upstairs represents a painting by a different painter it only seemed right that their name should be part of the title, which is many names, 18 names. Um, but in general, um, my titling usually has to do with um, the place that I made it or where a certain image comes from more than any kind of poetic outside thinking. Laurie, I'd like to ask a follow-up question because you have been working on this series for eight years and this is the first time it's been shown in public. Um, how, what was your consideration in continuing this series and how do you feel now that it actually does have a public life? Well, I was thinking about how um, some artists have really recognizable pot palettes. And um, so I, in choosing paintings that I was going to weave, I started thinking about um, paintings that I identified with a painter's body of work. And um, I forgot the question. Um, <laughs> I knew that would happen. Um, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. I, I, I was asking just about how you kept, wh how and why you kept going in your own mind with the series and what it's like to see it now in, in the public well, space. Well, I, I think that um, sometimes they were really surprises, um, like the Parsons painting when I cut it up or Mary Heilman's painting, um, the pattern that it made that was really graphic. Um, and then I cut up a, a Sean Scully painting and I was really disappointed. It's like, wow, his color and his brush strokes are so amazing. What happened? And then I tried another one and it was better. But um, I, I think that I started to feel a balance of color that I was looking for in someone's painting um, that I started to perceive might be interesting rearranged. Um, Alice, I'd, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question just about your piece because when we installed it, we actually tried it three different ways on the wall. And um, I mean, it's always wonderful to install with an artist and it's always exciting to see how those kind of calibrations happen. But I would love to hear your thoughts about that process now that it is installed. Um, yeah, a special thank you to Carrie and her, her patience with those three attempts. Um, I, 
I've been lately just trying to give myself permission until the moment something's installed that's still in process. And um, the, the piece, the, the section that's on the floor is the part that I, I made in 2022. And um, and the previous one, I've been, I mean, it was generally, it was just a horizontal, and then I added that. Um, and with the, and so with the play with installation, I was just really trying to see if, if we hung it at a diagonal, would we create dynamism? And in my studio, I'm not able to get the distance, and um, so thanks again, Carrie. <laughs> Um, and Candice, you saw your work in two different places in the upstairs. Yeah. Um, we obviously wanted to establish that dialogue with the Lynn, uh, with the Daniel Lynn Ramos. But for you, what was it like to see this piece where it, literally you could not necessarily stand it up in the bedroom, um, to see it come into the church? What struck you? Well, it's an odd piece to begin with because um, the branch, uh, the limb was broken off from the tree, in the be you know, from the beginning, it was on a beach. And um, uh, so I didn't know what was top or bottom from the beginning. It, it's it kind of uh, you know it just fit in the in the room, um, and I was interested to see how it would look hung. I I thought it would be hung up on the wall uh, horizontally, um, like on a a blank wall, you know, blank white wall horizontally with. Um, with a lot of the, the back uh, roving material, the wool kind of hanging out a little bit. But um, I really do like um, how it was changed and put in front of the elevator because first of all, you can see it from, the, from inside the elevator. It modernizes a piece that, um, you know, is one of the oldest forms of weaving is on a, um, w that the Africans use, is uh, on a tree limbs. And um, so this to me is like a, a updated version of an African loom. That's why I started using tree, tree uh, you know, large trees, because you don't need a loom. You can get the largest um, size inside your house while you're, while you're weaving. And um, it just kills all the birds with one stone. Um, and, um, and it's great because this is the first time I'm showing it and it kind of sets a, a um, pattern for future. Um, if I show, I have a one that I just finished that's also taking up a lot of space in the house. Uh, it's about um, what I'm thinking of is the Nick colors. It's it, uh, the basketball team. Um, and I made it like a, a hoop, but it, you know, the middle of the, the where, where this one is in the middle of the, it, it has a, a larger curve. So um, it will have to be hung in a space that shows that. Th this particular one, forward hoe, um, is, uh, it is one that could be shown either horizontally or vertically, but I love that it goes with the, with the <coughs> church's architecture so well. That glass in back of it and the reflections and the up and down, it goes along with the Edward Lear poem also in that um, the Jumblies are, you know, going out to sea and they're coming back after 20 years and it's an ongoing 
um, set of madnesses uh, with these green face and blue people. And, um, and when you're in the elevator, you can't really see uh, colors as they are. So it's, I think it's a perfect um, spot for it. I'd like to ask you a follow-up question um, about the installation of your work, because you did have further ideas about adding certain things that ultimately you decided not to do. But I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about that f thought process. Yes, uh, there were other branches I was uh, initially thinking about adding to the back or of the um, of the piece. There were uh, uh, beautiful polony, I think that's how it's pronounced, tree branches that uh, were going to uh, be. Uh, kind of diagonally placed. And uh, so that the forward hoe piece uh, would um, jut out a little bit more. Those other branches, which are still here in the church, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, would be the stanchioning of the piece. And also, I also in my car trunk right now, is the rest of the rope that's on the bottom with the rest of the, it's a, <clears throat> an old rope from my brother's boat. Um, that's like ancient uh, that I was going to uh, put on. And then there's crockery that's uh, in the poem that, uh, you know, that's broken. That's kind of a Japanese or an Asian type crockery. My cat broke it this big lamp and I was going to add that at the bottom. But in, in essence, you know, when something comes into the space where it's going to be shown, you pare down. <laughs> <laughs> to change gears um, just a little bit, um, I'd, I'd like us to discuss, um, you know, what are the inspirations that you take from working here in this specific area? And um, one of the reasons I'm asking this question is, um, you know, Laurie, you have used a lot of the flora and fauna. Um, Candace, I'm obviously interested in, in your move into weaving and then also the ideas of, of what are here and how you've been reflecting on, on your life and your family's life. And then Alice, um, you know, I, I'd love to just talk to you um, almost specifically about now where, um, or now here, sorry, um, over in Amagansett. And if you haven't been there, please go and see the show. It's fantastic. But one of your circles you have looking as though it's kind of just dropping into the center of the world. So if you could each reflect and think about, you know, what this place has brought to your work and or perhaps what you work against working here, I, I think this would, could be a really interesting discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a loaded bag. Um, for me, having grown up here uh, and seeing how things have been changing here, that's a hard thing. So I, I started out um, as a visual artist working in photography and very often photographing the landscape. And I found that my field of vision kept getting narrower and narrower. So I wouldn't use a wide angle lens, I started to use a portrait lens to photograph things in the landscape because I kept wanting to eliminate all the extra stuff that was going on. And um, another thing um, about being here as an artist that's, I mean, first of all, that's a positive thing that's so beautiful here, is the crazy incredible light that we have and um, how attached I feel the light is to feeling alive and um, vibrant. Uh, the other thing is the community of creativity that I have been aware of since I was very little, um, whether it's your neighbor who was a poet or a musician or 
you know, all the writers that used to get together in the Bridgehampton area. Um, I had a summer job working at Bobby Vans, and every famous artist that was in my reading list for that summer was a customer. Uh, it's just um, so, um, and then there's the great tradition of the painters. Um, that said, oh, this is such a loaded question. You can go all over the place, can't we? <laughs> Um, I think there's, you know, a big social um, thing here, which is really limited, and um, I think that leads me to want to travel a lot um, for inspiration, um, but I'm going to give the mic to someone else now. <laughs> I'll come back if you want. <laughs> I'm a summer person from childhood. Uh, uh, my family is, uh, came out in the 50s, I guess, and uh, our first house was on Hampton Street, kind of diagonally across from uh, the gas station there. Uh, and, you know, the Eastville neighborhood. Um, but my mother is never satisfied in houses so we, we had to move to Sag Harbor Hills where she was closer to her friends in the water, et cetera. And nobody could talk her out of it. Uh, the children and the family, of course, loved, um, well, let me go back a little. It, it took us a while to get a house out here. We looked, we were in Martha's Vineyard for a long time, and that's where we wanted to stay. It's very child centric, uh, it, it's just a great place. A um, lot of interracial marriages there and um, my, my mom's father and mother f are interracial. And um, you know, very beautiful community. So, but my dad liked the fact that um, Long Island is just closer to get to, you know, you don't have to, um, take the ferry and, you know, be driving six hours, et cetera. So, and we were really young at that time. Just having come back from having spent every summer with my father's mother in Dothan, Alabama during segregation. And um, that was horrible. That's, you know, I could go on and on about that. It's, uh, you just couldn't go out on your own. Uh, there were rules, and um, my grandmother had uh, five children when her husband died at 47, and she ran a farm on her own, and, you know, we just watched her kill a chicken every day for dinner, and, you know, it was, but when Emmett Till was killed, my father decided we couldn't go there anymore. We couldn't go south. And so we started looking for somewhere to go in the summers. That led to Martha's Vineyard first and then Sag Harbor. And um, it was just great out here. As you say, the arts community, you know, first of all, it gets infused into you when you see Truman Capote sitting on a stoop in Bridgehampton. You know, um, there was a, 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 an antique store across the uh, street from our house. And we'd go there every Saturday and heard Hatfield would be there and all those old time stars who you, you knew who they were. You know, we were a very literate family. And um, uh, so uh, it's, it's almost like you're going to be an artist when you grow up, you know? <laughs> oh, I always knew that anyway. And um, so, uh, you know, then we moved into Sac Harbor Hills, and that was great, close to the beach. One day, my dad decides he wants to move to Bridgehampton. Uh, he, there's lots of reasons I won't go into all of them, but um, we didn't like the idea at all. And um, uh, it, it was, Bridgehampton was a different place at that point. It was, you know, the potato pickers, and it, you know, people weren't hap that happy with the summer people. You know, it's like you're coming in, like, who are you people, you know? And, uh, but 
after a while, it became great. You know, um, we had always been going to the ocean. That was a big part of our lives, you know, the beach. You asked about the water. Um, it was just great sitting on the beach from morning till night, no matter where, whether it was Sag Harbor or, or Bridgehampton or, you know, we went to Flying Point. You just <coughs> meet, like, tons of strangers that you just, you know, it's just uh, the most wonderful place in the world. And then this was my church when I, uh, you know, when I was raising my family, uh, this was our church. Um, and my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, uh, is a singer and a songwriter. So, um, you know, to see it change and become the church is, <laughs> fantastic you know it's even better than the Methodist Church it's I think it's a more spiritual place than the Methodist Church could have ever have been and um, and it's almost uh, what it was built to be I think at this point um, I didn't grow up here. I, I came here in, um, as a young adult. I've been here since 1993. Um, what I would say about out here, um, well, the, I came from, I was living out west, and there, there's a big difference in terms of vista, and I'm so into um, the sublime, like being overwhelmed by space. But going to the beach and just almost religiously going and just looking at the horizon over the years cumulatively, I think, has had a really large effect. Though defensively, um, I had to write up something for the piece in Amagansett th that's most relevant to the piece upstairs. It's a wave, a wave pattern. Um, and in, in, the, in the description I say, I'm um, referencing the ocean, but I'm not representing the ocean. Um, so I'm just sort of trying to dance that line. I think there's something really interesting going on with scale in each of your work. Um, and um, since you spoke last hope, perhaps you can talk just a little bit about the expansiveness and the way your piece kind of comes off the floor. The idea of the repetition, which it would appear to be able to continue infinitely. Um, I'd be very interested to hear about that. Um, and then maybe we, uh, after that, we can talk about some of the other areas. But to speak about that expansiveness of that work upstairs in the different ways that it manifests itself would be, I think, very interesting. Um, so could you uh, give me a different word, just so I make, I'm, I'm clear about what you mean by expansiveness. Um, the fact that you've said that, you know, a lot of this work that you have been do doing with the tabs, it, it, there's an idea that it, it can almost self-produce and just keep expanding. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I like to think of myself at times as uh, a farmer, and I, um, I feel like it's successful, a piece is successful, and it starts to reproduce itself and that there's a, a potency that it could grow. Um, I love it when there's no beginning or end. And so that was a struggle for me with the piece here in the church because there's clearly a beginning. Um, I, yeah, so uh, it's also just the fecundity aspect and abundance and I'm just so seduced by um, the, uh, the aesthetics of Using the same part over and over, and when it gets so, when it gets to a quantity that's uncountable, there's the number doesn't definitely doesn't matter, but there's 
in my experience, there's like a, a an experience of the sublime. Um, so I'm I'm very very seduced by repetition from that standpoint as well. Candice, to talk about scale with your work, um, I mean, you have been recognized and celebrated for your use of African heddles, and that remains something that is incredibly important to you, um, I think, personally and as an artist. Um, but I, I am interested in this leap that you've made to obviously a bigger canvas, and I'm interested in where you think that's going to go. Interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's one that's been on my mind. Um, I've always wanted to do huge work. I have huge ideas. And uh, it's a struggle in this world to, to, to uh, from, you know, when I went to undergraduate school, uh, Joel Perlman was my sculpture teacher. And um, I just saw him the other night at the, at the parish. It's interesting that, you know, the conversations we had then, and I remember every one of them, and so does he, about, about scale. You talk about scale. It's been my ever-present thing. Um, I wanted to do huge work. Then the work that I'm doing now that's at Una House is kind of uh, finally getting into some of those ideas and it's taken all this time. Um, he, he, he talked to me about the negatives more than than, uh, you know, putting me on a positive path to the alternative, to not, ha I had a, a, you know, small apartment. Uh, well, I had a couple of apartments, but, you know, when you're raising two children, you're, you know, he talked to me about, you know, how my arm would get larger from the hoisting and the, he gave me such the, I, my eyes were rolling back in my head and, <laughs> about why I couldn't do what I had in my head to do. So I changed my direction a little. I started doing the uh, found object uh, <laughs> series, like the refrigerators on Battery Park City. Uh, you know, my father, I told him what I was going to do, and he, he had a Cadillac convertible, and he, he would put these refrigerator doors and bring them in to the city to for me to work on. He, he, I, I, without my father, I couldn't have done half the work I've done. Um, I think he's an artist in his mind, you know. So anytime I needed sod, he would bring it in. Oh, God, I just bothered that man so much for, for every piece of material. Um, so as I said, I started doing the found object thing and blowing things up that way and uh, and you know I I put the steel pieces you know the rusted metal and steel I put all of that on the back burner is I had been talked out of it and um, I didn't you know I I think I was so overwhelmed um, just with my own life just uh, I I couldn't think of what to do in the like maquettes and all the things that Almond does with her, uh, with her designs before she does the large scale pieces, I I didn't work like that at all. I I used to bring in like uh, you know the the uh, cable the things that those wooden things that cables are wrapped Spools. on yeah. Spool, those things. yeah I used to drag that into school and you know. I did so many bizarre things trying to get larger scale work done. Um, 
and um, so so I'm kind of like the queen of the small thing that gets made into the bigger thing. And it's okay because now I can do both happily, you know. Before it was just like, if I don't do this big thing, I, I'm just not gonna be happy about it, you know. But it's fine. Yeah. Laurie, um, you obviously, what I find interesting in the work that you have on display upstairs and much of the work that you have done previously, um, you've certainly had an interest in dyes and wools and the material. And what I find interesting in the work upstairs is, is you are dealing almost with a ready-made. I mean, it's an ent it feels like an intervention on a ready-made. And I'm interested in that dichotomy. And I'm interested in if one is winning out over the other, <laughs> if that's a too simplistic a way to put it. I, I'm interested in, in how you are thinking about this question. OK. So I am really driven by material and how it feels in my hand, or how it looks to the exciting little things in my eyes that perceive things. Um, texture and uh, intricacies of fibers is something that's really ultimate for me in doing what I do. So um, making something that doesn't have some kind of quality of um, interest to me that doesn't get made. Um, so with this work, um, it stems from me starting to feel really restless about making printed photographs on paper. Uh, one day I ran from my studio to my house to get a linen napkin and I decided I was going to try to put it through my printer and see if I could print on linen. And um, my printer didn't like that too much, but I since found a way to feed linen into the, a different printer. And um, I, if I can start with that substrate that has this feel and movability and um, haptic quality, I'm already engaged. And um, so the work upstairs, um, it really, I, I, I might have mentioned it earlier, it really was a curiosity about color that got me started on it. And uh, I can remember looking at some Jack Youngerman paintings when I was, I don't know if you know the series of bark cloth um, work I did where I photographed bark cloth on linen and then I went in and embroidered it. I remember distinctly looking at some paintings from the 1950s by Jack Youngerman and thinking about the colors that he used and how I would never think about using those colors and then I started playing with those colors in my own way. And um, so that led me to really look at paint painters' palettes or the way they use color in their work in a way I never had before, which continues. And um, so they're printed on the linen that I found um, that works in my printer. And um, I love being able to rearrange um, the pieces and to create something new. And at the same time, I was able to take each painting that I was working with and make them all the same size. Um, and I mean, of course, sometimes I, some of it got left on the cutting room floor, as they say. But um, for the most part, um, I love being able to make something that's kind of universal is not the right word, but it will do. Um, something that had a uniform uh, nature to it. Um, but still had this tactile aliveness. And I went upstairs earlier today, and I love how some of them are starting to curl a little bit from just being there. And to me, that feels good that it's alive, like the material is to me. 
Um, I would like to open it up to questions um, from the audience, but before I do, I would like to ask each of you um, what the institutions in our area can do to support local artists better. <laughs> wow. Well, first of all, I will compliment the energy that so many um, institution directors and boards and curators, et cetera, are doing because it's giant leaps from even 10 years ago. So kudos. Um, but you guys have ideas? Well, I love the print again. Is that how it's pronounced? The microphone. The, oh, the print, print again, print again. Yes, I, you know, I, I think this institution is really doing a lot to bring um, new ways of doing art to the community. I mean, it's here if you want to jump on the website and, and uh, sign up for things uh, if you're interested. The parish did a lot of that. Um, when I first came out, I really didn't know the, the uh, year-round community. I didn't know who was out here year-round. So I went to the parish to a number of classes that they had. It wasn't, you know, nobody knew me from Adam. It wasn't about, you know, um, artists versus community person taking a um, writing a class based on ICFRAX or uh, stenciling that Andrea Cote taught. Or, I think just more of that um, in every institution. So people can, and you know, maybe some nights the, the, the museums or the um, organizations could be opened so people who work can come in um, later uh, than uh, the afternoon or the weekend. Um, it's just like this, I said Saturday afternoon I'd be on the beach um, uh, but, uh, you know, that's where it could start, maybe. Well, I, I just want to thank the church um, for what you're, what you're doing so far um, and how you're redefining what it is to be a local artist. I, strugg I struggle with that word out here, um, especially when there's such legacy to being local. So um, I think um, I've just been super inspired and I feel very embraced. So thank you. Yeah. Um, one, thi one thing potentially is um, organizing studio visits perhaps. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Sam has a microphone, and he wants to share it with somebody. Oh, Talina does too. OK. Hi. It's um, not a question, just something to make you feel better. Uh, even painters, when, when they draw, they, they get it's just recently, I would say in the last 10 years, maybe eight years, that drawing is becoming recognized as a complete and fully formed art practice. So what I like to remind younger artists when I work with them is that artists need to have a like 90% craft, and I, and I tend to offend a lot of f high, f fine artists or when they think they're highbrow. I said, and the 10% is just magic. So what you all do, like a painter does, we have to know our craft, you know your craft then the 10% is magic, and that's what makes you an artist. Well, I'm, I'm going to answer back that. Uh, you know, I taught for 35 years in, uh, in uh, an urban high school in Manhattan um, with kids who everybody, you know, they shudder when I say that. It's like, how could you? Um, those are the best kids to work with. They know the streets. They know the, the community. They know everything you don't know, so they're teaching you also. Uh, and you know, 
the one thing that you first have to get across to uh, students like that is that anyone can be an artist. They don't believe it. You know, first of all, they don't want to get dirty. <laughs> and um, drawing, you say, you know, it's like drawing, you don't have to get really dirty. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the first hurdle with black students is don't get me near paint that's going to get on my sneakers or my clothes. Um, and secondly, is the, what's the point of this? So, um, you know, I think, you know, you start with anyone can be an artist. Let's put you in the thinking that you can be an artist, number one. You know, I, I used to love to do that. You know, yeah, you're an artist because you say you are an artist. And that gets across the, the main point, the hurdle, I should say. Just before we move on, Laurie, um, you have experience teaching weaving in uh, the Riverhead prison, uh, which I believe was a project you did with the parish. Would you like to elaborate? Oh, that's a program by the uh, started by the New Hour Foundation, and Bastian participated it, uh, in it as well. Um, unfortunately, COVID kind of snipped it just as it was getting going, but it was uh, really eye-opening to me to be with people who were confined, um, some of them waiting for trials, some wait, or waiting for sentencing and that kind of thing. Um, I, you know, we live here in this beautiful place and 25 miles away is this institution where people are confined and it was really incredible to be able to bring creativity or the time, allow them to have time and materials and a space within this confinement. Um, and it was really interesting to hear their conversations with each other. Um, what I did was I took images of beautiful places I had been, and I printed it, and I cut, I nearly cut through the photograph, but left a little bit that they could cut. Of course, they couldn't use real scissors. Um, so I wanted them to see the image before it was completely taken apart, and then let them weave it together, adding colors to it. And it was so remarkable to hear their conversations about what they were going to do when they got out of there and how they were going to go there with their daughter and how they, um, you know, I just felt like I gave them a second to think about something optimistic and the real world or the potentially real world. Um, and I, I hope it is something that will be picked up again. Um, but I, have you worked with imprisoned people as well? Yeah, it's... Um, well, uh, uh, younger, mm -hmm. not adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? That's Sam. Sam is doing our printmaking workshops now. Yay! He's a genius. <laughs> and he's working with um, actually Sue Bashman, who was part of the Printaganza. So everybody should sign up for a monoprint workshop. Well. Yeah. Um, except they keep selling out. So the minute you see it, quick jump on it. Um, I just wanted to say that, like, to your point about into this discussion about certain kinds of bringing art to people and inviting artists and getting more interaction from the community, including the local artists, which I kind of feel like is like saying woman artist, like I hate it. Because you know, you're an artist or you're not an artist and, and you might be a more fully developed, more achieved, whatever you know, on a personal level or judged by society, but artist is an artist. And one of our goals here has always been to try to break down prejudices about um, what makes somebody a creative, 
and thinking that it's more important. Eric expressed this really well when we were, you know, brainstorming endlessly about what could the church be, but trying to make people feel like they had a place here from all different points of creativity, like a, a great teacher, a great a scientist who comes up with something. And I don't just mean like a eureka moment, but the way that creativity is deeply a part of the scientific process for scientists too. And just trying to make people feel more comfortable about that. But I guess this isn't really a question, but I, I just wanted to thank you all for being here because I love all your work in this show so much. And the way that this show has, for me personally, like exploded my sense of how art comes into my head. It's been just like earth shattering for me because, and it happened too when we were, Sarah and I were, we took Project Most Kids around and the kids had this amazing reaction to the work. Like they got up to the Ernesto Neto, the one that has the, the droopy parts and there's in the middle there's a bag of the sculpture, there's a bag of bay leaves and the kids got up there and they all just laid down underneath it. Like they just flattened themselves out and laid underneath it like it was weighing them down or something or they were soaking it up. But there's, there's a different kind, I think, of physical reaction, like literally, like a, a different kind of, who said haptic? You said haptic. A haptic reaction to this show that I think comes on you, not maybe the first time you see it, but maybe the second or third, you start to realize that your body's interacting with the work in a different way. And each of you have that in your work. And I think it's really a profound sea change and gives you the, the blessing that we get when we look at art and society and art history and all the revisionist things that need to happen because of our stupid prejudices, like, like artists are white male artists, or artists are, do not include indigenous people, or they're making crafts. It's very nice, but it's craft. You know, I mean, all of these stupid prejudices that we need to break down, and this show in a, in a really profound way has, I just want to say thank you because it's worked on me in a way that I didn't expect. So it's been like a great joy, like experiencing the physicality and the depth of the experience of the show. Thank you. So, and I don't know, that, I guess you. that wasn't a question, but you, you tell me what I should have been asking. Because <laughs> I know there's a question here somewhere. In the front and then in the back. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. But going back again to studio visits, um, unfortunately, due to COVID, um, when they had the drive-by, yeah. was such an amazing experience for me to actually see these wonderful artists in their immediate surrounding. Mm -hmm. And I would love to repeat that because it makes it even more real you see the materials, you see that, you know, all of that together. And I would actually love to see like a Google map of all the artists so we that you can that. go online <laughs> and you can actually see how many artists are out yeah. here and click on it and actually see their work and kind of, you know, be able to be intrigued to want to follow up on it and see more. So that's... Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so I have a question for Lori. And speaking of the materiality that April just talked about, could you talk a little bit about the move from photography to textile-based in terms of the material? Okay. So with photography for me, I think the reason I used it for so long, um, well, it's multifaceted, but um, one of the things is that with photography, you can sort of reflect the truth, although it, that truth gets altered a lot. But basically, you can start with something that really exists. And I liked that a lot as a starting point. And um, I think that the shift for me came in a conscious way. In about 2013, I was lucky enough to be photographing in Captiva, specifically at Robert Rauschenberg's property, which um, 
was this incredible natural habitat that was jungle-like with all these vines that were growing up and down in every which way and trees that were choking each other. And I became so interested in the fibrous action that happens in nature in a really outspoken way. And then I um, went to the high desert in Nevada where things were growing really close to the ground and um, you know, desperate for water, like crawling flat against the soil and nothing was going up. And I started to see the same kind of thrust for life, these vines that were holding the sandy soil or powdery soil down. And I just really started looking at fiber in the landscape and um, when I was pr printing an exhibition of these images from Captiva, one day I just got like itchy fingers and I um, had to go find the yarn that had been in storage in my attic for <coughs> 20 some years and pull it out and start knitting in response to the sensation I had from the visual experience of this jungly landscape. So I started to knit at night after working uh, in the studio printing. Um, and um, then when I would go out in the morning for a little bit, I always photograph for about an hour a day. I found that the knitting had inspired um, observations of nuances um, in vegetal uh, vegetation and its growth. And um, so I kind of went back and forth and eventually I let the two of them become friends and I'm a much happier person. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one more question in the back. Yeah. Um, I, I think you uh, in the way you talk about what you do, sell yourself short. Uh, I think the, um, uh, a April alluded to it, <clears throat> and I firmly believe that you can teach process of creativity from you know, little kids to uh, aged people, but art doesn't actually come into the process till farther down the line. And that takes a very particular kind of person who can go that distance, which you've all obviously gone, gone that distance. Um, and it's, it's within that, that space between the creative act, which we can all share, and the, uh, how uh, an artist actually takes it further into, uh, I think, deeper meanings of life and uh, um, significance and, and things like that. that. That is the place where the object has to shine by itself. And, uh, it, it, it's interesting in the, the way you were presenting yourselves, uh, you know, you all share one thing, which is you all work with your hands, your fingers, specifically, you all work with materials that are, are woven together in, in some way or another. But that's not how you got to where you got to. And, uh, the, you know, each you, you're trying to find process and materials that express a, a greater vision, a deeper need it's, uh, along those lines. I, I uh, you know, you, you were just talking, I think, in terms of an inspiration of shifting from photography to weaving, which really gets into the, insightfully gets into a, a process of an artistic leap that uh, you know is responding to something so fundamental to you, which which has to do with with a relationship to nature, and and whatnot. Uh, I was I was surprised um, 
Candace, that you didn't talk about the, 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 the historical aspect, the racial history that you deal with on a daily basis in your work and trying to piece it back together again, try to understand it, et cetera. And, and I think the uh, sort of implicit thing in, in Hope's work where she's using materials that have come to pollute the world in some way, come to, to threaten uh, y you know, the, the uh, waste and transforming waste into a, uh, a, a, a you know an, a transformed object, an exquisite form, a poetic thing and stuff. That that's where you all live, and that's where you actually, you know, really communicate to us as an audience a, a, a transformative experience and. As you can see, I'm not forming a question here, but more of a scolding. <laughs> because I, I admire I everything that you do and feel that you need to own it in a, in a way be, and be proud of it. Yeah. And so there. I think you, you, you should have been up here with us, Eric. <laughs> I'm scolding everybody today. <laughs> you know, you have to be asked a certain type of question if you want that type of answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> if you were all talking individually about Wait, Angela, it's coming. I think if you'd all been talking about your work individually, you would have gotten, you would have gone deep. But this is, this has been a, a you know, a convivial mm -hmm. conversation. And I think you've all s said some amazing things. I'm, I've got lots of takeaways in my head. Um, but yeah, it would be great to like have you all back and, and give a longer talk about all the greater details. And Eric can ask us those questions. And Eric is going to be here <laughs> to lead that conversation. Okay, one more question, the lady in green. Hi, I'm Ursula Hege, I'm a writer, and um, I loved how the details that you talked about in the creative process, um, I kept identifying, and I kept identifying. So what you just said, the scolding that you're not doing um, yourself, how, how did you start? You're not doing yourself justice, I, I remember, and I found it really insensitive. I thought what we witnessed today was extraordinary. And I think you take ownership in what you're creating, ownership in this whole search. You know, you, you, we don't know what it's going to end up to be, okay? If I already knew the ending of a book, I wouldn't need to write it. But so I totally applaud you for an extraordinary performance. Here, here. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you to you in the audience. Um, the show is open. Please come back soon.